This is Friday, February 3rd, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Zebulon Weaver Heights. Welcome, Zebulon. May I ask when you were born? Uh, June the 8th, 1923. And where were you born? In uh, Washington, D.C., and specifically in the Georgetown Hospital. And what town do you currently live in? Arlington, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I'm single. And do you have children? I do. How many children? I, I have two children. And any grandchildren? No, no. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I, I have two grandchildren. They're twin boys. Really? Congratulations. Now then, uh, tell, uh, do you did you live in Washington, D.C. during your childhood? I, I lived in Washington, D.C. until I was four years old. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother suffered a mental breakdown from mm -hmm. which she never recovered. So from then on, I lived with my grandparents mm -hmm. in Asheville, North Carolina. And tell us a little bit about Asheville, North Carolina when you were growing up. Asheville, North Carolina is, was, is probably the most beautiful place on earth as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the mountains. Uh, the only thing it lacks that New England has probably is the sea seashore. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to go far enough in North Carolina, you could also get to the seashore. But from <laughs> Asheville, that would be 500 miles. Mm-hmm. And did you go to high school? I went to high school in Asheville. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, it was a four-year school from the eighth grade through the eleventh grade. What happened to the twelfth? They never had a twelfth back then. The 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 it, this was during the Deep Depression and. Mm -hmm. Towns could barely afford to pay their teachers, uh, much less have the extended education. If you lived in the outer counties, mm -hmm. you had not nine months of school, but only eight for the same basic reason. Mm -hmm. How was life in Asheville during the Depression? Uh, everybody uh, struggled pretty hard, and uh, but Asheville's very famous, of course, and the author Thomas Wolfe made it even more famous with his uh, first novel called Look Homeward Angel. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my grandfather happened to be a member of Congress, so he was a little better off than some, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, adversely to that, uh, all of his children came to live with him because, he didn't, because they didn't have any jobs, so he ended up having to support an mm -hmm. extended family. Okay. What did you do after high school? Uh, immediately after high school, I left and went up to D.C. and fiddled around for about a year. Uh, I worked in a department store, uh, one of the bigger department stores in Washington called, Heck, called the Heck Company. Mm -hmm. And tell us what Washington was like back then. Let's see, Washington in, in 1940, of course, FDR was the president, and uh, we still weren't out of the woods, uh, uh, the, but the Depression was beginning to be over. So, mm -hmm. uh, And Washington, D.C., of course, as maybe everyone knows, is a, is a Depression-free city because it's the seat of government. And I would say probably 75% of the people there work for the government. Mm -hmm. So the, the economics were, were good there mm -hmm. in that particular part of the country. Okay. Let's bring yourself up to December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Uh, right. What were you doing? Uh, I got up that morning, December the 7th, I was staying with my father, who lived in downtown Washington, and my grandfather was living out in Bethesda, Maryland. Mm -hmm. So I get in my car, I get in my father's car, I should say, and 
begin the drive to Bethesda to see my grandfather. That was a Sunday morning. And on the way, I happened to be traveling Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, and I passed the Japanese embassy, and I could see this great flurry of activity. Mm -hmm. I could just look kind of over some walls and wow. see people burning stuff, and they were they were burning documents in the outdoor barbecue. Wow. And um, so I then continued on to my grandfather's house where he announced to me that, uh, that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and that uh, President Roosevelt had declared this a day of infamy. Okay, so where and when did you enter the military? Uh, I decided that uh, here I am, I'm a 19-year-old, I'm, I'm bound to get caught up in the draft, and mm -hmm. I don't want to be in the infantry. So I went and I took the aviation cadet exam, at which I excelled and made a very high grade, which made the which made the recruiting officer's eyes pop. And uh, that, was, that was in October of 42. My orders came to enter the service on February the 1st, 1943. And you were in the Army Air Corps? Right. Okay. What were you doing between uh, the cadet exam and when your orders came? Well, I was, I was living there in, in Asheville and just basically doing nothing. Uh, I think I had a job at the, I had a job as an usher at the local theater, mm -hmm. local movie theater. Uh, I think the pay at that time was $12.50 per week. Pretty good money, good money? No, no, that was not good money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get back you into the military. And did our family of friends join the service when you did? Uh, yes, a, a, lot of my, a lot of my friends, a lot of my high school friends, mm -hmm. uh, and this was a sort of a, I don't know, a, an all-wide nation thing that, mm -hmm they called those of us who were, were sitting waiting on the same day. So February the 1st, 1943, people mm -hmm. from all over the country were sent to some, some place for basic training, actually. And where did you and go? And we went to Miami Beach, Florida. Not the worst place. In February, and they had issued us a, a little jacket <laughs> And then they decided, well, Miami, Florida, you don't need a jacket. One morning it was 32 degrees down there. <laughs> and but all we did for about a month and a half was to run around uh, the golf courses. It was all physical training. There was nothing technical about it. And do calisthenics and, and run and run 10 miles and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And uh, the, the colonel in charge there liked to invite foreign generals from South America to review the troops. And one day it poured rain. I think we had two uniforms, two khaki uniforms. So here we are soaking wet. And this idiot colonel uh, made out a general order which stated, the practice of men getting wet in the rain will cease immediately. I like to see how that was enforced. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, what else do you remember about BASIC? Well, the big thing I remember is one particular morning, uh, we went to breakfast and they had kind of crude implements for doing the cooking and the washing of the dishes and everybody got diarrhea. Oh dear. So then they sent us out to run around the golf course wow. and there was a sudden 
eruption of people trying to get into the latrines. <laughs> All right, basic is behind you. What happened next? Uh, the U.S. Air Force and what other people of the government, I don't know, but they decided that because they could not send us immediately to pilot school or navigation mm -hmm. school or whatever, the, the, the program was called um, something college detachments. I mm -hmm. can't remember, but at any rate, they utilized the facilities of all these little sort of non-heard of uh, schools around the country and sent people to, to learn to basically learn certain technical skills. Uh, and they did take us up in, to fly in a, one of these little Piper Cubs or something just mm -hmm. to get the feel of what it was like to fly an airplane. But then they talk, taught us all about the theory of flying and aircraft recognition mm -hmm. and things like that. And where, do you remember exactly where you learned all this theory? Yes. And where was that? Cumberland University in Lebanon, Tennessee, which is where Cordell Hall graduated from law school, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, tell us what happened next. What happened next? Um, we were sent, Lebanon, Tennessee is probably 15 or 20 mm -hmm. miles from Nashville. Nashville was the uh, official U.S. Air Corps, um, trying to think of the word, um, classification center, okay. where they would decide if you were going to be a navigator, a pilot, or a bombardier. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, I, uh, I was accepted as to go to pilot school. And where did you go to for pilot school? And, and for basic training, I went to uh, Camden, South Carolina. And what happened there? And I, I went through that. I went through that and finished that. Mm -hmm. And then we went to basic training, which was another school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got about halfway through basic training and I got washed out of the pilot program. Oh, what happened? It, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, they, they might be, they might have been told to get rid of a certain amount of trainees or whatever, mm -hmm. I don't know. But at any rate, one day the, the, the instructor says, well, go up to 15,000 feet and do a seven turn spin. Well, it, it's something you're not supposed to do. So you're, you're in, uh, what do they call it, catch 22. If, mm -hmm. you do it, if you do it, you're gonna be washed out. And if you don't do it, you're gonna be washed out because you didn't obey the orders. Mm -hmm. So. That's how that goes. So I went and I then was, I was supposed to go right to navigation school, but because there were no classes open at that time, I was sent to gunnery school down in Florida. You've been taking a lot of school since February 1st, 1943. Where does this bring us to now? Uh, what month and year? Uh, gosh, let me stop and think. Uh, let's see, I, I was I was in Miami, Florida for five weeks. That's mm -hmm. from February, so that puts me up into March. I was in uh, I was in that college training detachment for actually about a month and a half. Okay, and I got released from there to go to pilot school, okay. not pilot school, actually mm -hmm. pre-flight training, okay, which, was yeah. in, which was in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh -huh. So are we still in 1943? 
Oh, yeah. Okay, still a 43. So what happened in gunnery school? Well, uh, we had B-17s down there, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we would go up and either shoot plastic bullets at a sleeve on the end of a small airplane of some kind, or they, they would take the plastic bullets and coat them with like a crayon or something and we would shoot directly at the airplane mm -hmm. and each one of those colored bullets would make a mark on the airplane. Mm -hmm. So if you've got three gunners up there, each one of them's got a different color and they would find out how many hits out of, everybody was given the same number of mm -hmm. bullets, how many hits. So I know one day doing that, I got like 400 hits. That's very good. Mm. So I did well there, and then they had a lot of other training. Uh, uh, there, there was one called a Waller trainer where the screen was like concave. Yeah, and that was that was later used in uh, I forget what it was called, Cinerama. Mm -hmm. Does that does that name mean anything to you? Yes, it At does. At any rate, that was yeah. like three three cameras, one aimed at the center, one mm -hmm. aimed over here, and one aimed over here, and it would make a very realistic mm. 3D situation. Mm -hmm. And they would have the planes coming by and you'd have to try and shoot at those. Those were electronically registered somehow. Uh -huh. That was one of the trainers. Uh, and then, you know, we trained in the airplanes and mm -hmm. whatever. It was a, it was a thing to waste two, two months so you could then go to navigation school. And now you're in navigation school. <laughs> so I get sent to navigation school. That happens to be in Monroe, Louisiana, which, by the way, is the same field where Delta Airlines was founded. Mm -hmm. So tell us what happened at navigation school in Monroe, Louisiana. So navigation school was a uh, period of uh, lessons to learn about the stars and uh, how to use a, an octant or a sextant mm -hmm. and uh, all the tables and so forth. They give you books with tables. You always, navigation school, you always have to have an accurate watch and uh, Let's say, know what they, the navigators are called wind finders back in those days. It's mm -hmm. so much more complicated than what they have today with, mm -hmm. with all these GPS situations. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's basically what that was all about taking tests, going up and flying, and taking tests uh, to mm -hmm. see how well you can navigate. And uh, so that was about. I think, I think that was two months. Mm -hmm. So this brings us to the latter part of 1943? Yes. Okay. And I'm just curious, uh, I mean, you have been bouncing around several communities in the South while you were in school and training. Did you ever have a chance to visit the, um, the communities? Not very much. Not very much. Okay, so now you're finished with navigation school. What happens now? So then I got a small leave, maybe a week or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I'm sent back to Florida to meet up with a crew who are going to go across the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we trained together as a crew down there at Drew Field in Florida, which is in the Tampa Bay area. And what was your rank at that time? What was my what? Your rank. My rank at that time? Mm -hmm. I, I was an aviation cadet, okay. uh, supposedly, but the, the government likes to play games, of course, so they, instead of paying us $75 a month, they paid us $50 a month and called us Buck Privates. Okay, so what were you doing to earn the $50 a month? Besides, I mean, I, I know you were meeting up with the crew, you're training. How long did that take? 
Oh, of course. Of course, now, now that I've met up with my crew when I graduated from, from uh, navigation school, mm -hmm. then I was a second lieutenant, so I was no longer making $50 a month. All right. As a matter of fact, a second lieutenant then was making $150 a month, mm -hmm. and anybody on flying duty that flies four hours a month gets uh, flying pay, which is 50% of what your base pay is. Mm -hmm. So now I'm making, what, 225 And there are a few other little amenities like, uh, I, I can't remember now if I paid for my meals or if that mm -hmm. was, I think I think yeah I think I actually had to pay for my meals. Mm -hmm. Well, you could afford it now. Probably. <laughs> so tell us what happened next. So next is um, we trained together and went on flights and had overseers that would come on the airplane with us once in a while. They would test me to see if I knew how to navigate mm -hmm. and. Uh, Then they, 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 we, we were going to be, we, we, we flew together there for about probably two months. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we were sent across the ocean. So we, we went from, we went from um, Drew Field in Florida to Hunter Field in Georgia, but that was strictly a matter of going there long enough to pick up our the clothing we need and uh, for, for the area where you're going, which they know is going to be pretty cold, mm -hmm. and so you get things like winter underwear that you wouldn't get in other places, and all of our supplies and a brand new airplane that's, you know, just been flown in from where it was made. And uh, I think when we, when we flew across, we, we went from Hunter, we were only there in Hunter Field for less than a week. Mm -hmm. So we were then flown to, we then flew to Bangor, Maine. And we stayed there like maybe overnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we flew to Labrador, where we were supposed to stay overnight, but because the weather got bad, we mm -hmm. stayed there for about a week. And then eventually, after being there a week, the, the planes were so piled up and stacked up around there, they were almost one on top of each other, but they were really they were really filling almost every runway except one where somebody could take off. And then after being up in Labrador for about a week where we got stuck because of the weather, they um, called us one morning about 2 a.m. and said, okay, here we go. And we went out and got in the plane and took off. And we were supposed to go to Prestwick, Scotland. Mm -hmm. The weather out in the middle of the Atlantic got really, really bad. And they said, we'll come back. Well, we couldn't come back. We were too far. So we landed in Iceland. And we stayed in Iceland for about a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we flew on to England. And we landed in a place called Valley, Wales, which is now a big RAF air base. And so there we left this new airplane and we were, they have to take them somewhere and modify them and do things to mm -hmm. them before they go to a group. So then we went on to our group and there you basically don't fly for a couple of weeks. You, you, uh, not to the group. We went to this other place, uh, Bassingbourne, not Bassingbourne, Bovingdon, is the name of it. And that's near London. So there we stayed. And there we're taught the geography of England and a brief daily on uh, what's going on because this was slightly after D-Day. Mm -hmm. Uh, D-Day has already happened, 
and uh, we get briefed on that daily and then they teach us a lot of other things that are mm -hmm. practices that are not normal to us around that part of the world. Now, you uh, were you with a group at that time? Yes. And what group was that? That was the that was the 351st bombardment group. Squadron 511. And I understand from your notes this was part of the 8th Air Force? Yes, this is all the 8th Air Force. Okay. okay, you've been briefed in England. What happens next? Well, of course, the day comes when you're going to get in an airplane and put some bombs in it and fly over there and drop them, right? Mm -hmm. So that time has now arrived, and what happens is the the pilot goes and flies a mission as a co-pilot first to see what it's like. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he comes back and then, so he's, he's one ahead already. And uh, then we fly together. And our first mission was, I mean, do you want me to recount these one by one? I suppose not. No, uh, at least the first one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the first ones are kind of a nothing. The first ones are real milk run. We go not very far somewhere into Germany, mm -hmm. and I could see just a few bursts of flak out in the distance there somewhere, so we weren't anywhere near it. But then comes the big one, number two, mm -hmm. where we're going to be shot down. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so we take off and with, with the 8th Air Force, it takes about two hours to get the planes into a formation before they can leave. Mm -hmm. So here you go with this great bomber stream, which at that time was flying about 1,500 airplanes at a time. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so we fly out, we go up across the North Sea and across the Is it the Kiel, the Kiev, no, mm -hmm. what's the name of that cal canal up there? Denmark, it's in mm -hmm. Denmark. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. You fly across the Denmark, which is a peninsula, then down in through Hamburg. I don't know if you want to know all this or not. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And we get out to this little place we're supposed to bomb, which is on the northeast corner of Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, we kind of suspected that they sent us to this place to draw up the fighters, and that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there in my little navigator's compartment, and I look up, and I, I can just quickly count about 80 German fighters. Wow. And uh, they come in, they shoot us up pretty bad. We're the very last plane in that whole 8th Air Force stream mm -hmm. that's gone out 36 at a time, one behind the other. And uh, you'll find out that's about maybe 40 groups. Mm -hmm. So then we got shot up very bad. We had two engines shot out that are not operating at all on one side. And the normal airspeed indicated on the airspeed meter is 150, although at 28,000 feet, that might mean you're flying 350 miles an hour over the ground mm -hmm. and add or subtract whatever the wind does to that. So then we're cut back to about 110. So you look up and see all these planes just going away from you. It's kind of a bad feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, we then called and got some fight, the, the fight, our fighters had all run out of gas and had to turn and go home because mm -hmm. we're the end of the stream of planes and whatever. So, but we somehow got, for a short time, we got two fighter planes to come and kind of watch us for a while. But then they, they too had to disappear. Mm -hmm. And we flew on as best as we could and realize we're never going to make it across the English Channel because we're going to run out of gas. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we 
we, we eventually belly landed in Belgium in a place called La Bruyere, mm -hmm. which is L-A-B-R-U-Y-E-R-E. Okay. And you brought a picture of that, if you'd be so kind as to show it. Right. That's actually a monument uh, that was erected near where you crash landed. That's correct. And there are, the names of the crew are on that stone, right? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. So tell us what happened then. So then, of course, here we are in a place we don't know anything about, but the natives all swarmed around our airplane. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting fact is that George Patton, with his tanks, had only come through there 48 hours previous. Wow. And that's the only reason we were safe and not captured, because the Germans mm -hmm. were on all sides of us. And they were actually snipers in the trees in the immediate area. So we, we looked around, we found this, there was an anti-aircraft outfit somewhere around, and this sergeant came over, and we had three or 400 gallons of gasoline in the plane there that was not usable because of a certain way that it had to be pumped, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, some technicality, we couldn't use it. So we just, we just told them to come, they could get it and put it in five gallon cans. And whether they used it for legitimate or illegitimate reasons, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, they may have swapped it for mm -hmm. Calvados. And what are those? Calvados is a very strong brandy. Okay. So you're in Belgium, what happens now? So now we're looking around, we've got to have a place to stay. And of course these, these Belgians are, are inviting us to their houses, some of them, but we've got this army unit that was stationed in the, in the large town of Namur, mm -hmm. and, and they put us up in a hotel there. Mm -hmm. But I should, uh, I should go back and say that after the plane crashed, this very lovely young lady comes mm -hmm. up to me and wants to see inside the airplane, so I took her. And she's there with her bicycle with a Red Cross uh -huh. badge on it. And she says, well, come on back to the house, she says, and you can have a glass of wine. And Myself and the pilot, I think it was, went back with, with her, and she had to go downtown to wrap bandages or whatever it was she did for the mm -hmm. Red Cross. And we stayed and talked with her father, who was a very important person in Belgium and actually related to the royalty. Mm -hmm. So the Baroness, the young lady, is still a very good friend of mine. I have Matter of fact, I've got a letter from her right here in this thing. And uh, while you're getting that, uh, nobody was killed in the crash? Or? No, no no one was hurt. No one was hurt. Very fortunate. That's right. Now here, here is a picture of her house. I've stayed there, I've been uh -huh. there many times. Oh, very nice. The, these are some pictures, she, mm -hmm. that's one she made in the snow and mm -hmm. sent recently. And this is, this is a recent letter I've got to get uh -huh. somebody to read because she can't speak English. Oh dear. <laughs> is no. it in French or Belgian? It's or? in French. Yeah. Yeah, the southern part of Belgium speaks French, and the northern mm -hmm. part speak uh, Flemish, which is more of a Dutch-German. Right. Okay, so now you're in uh, Namur in Belgium in a hotel. What happens right. next? So then somebody comes and gets us and mm -hmm. takes us to Brussels, and where we get on an airplane, and they fly us to Paris. Mm -hmm. I think they thought we were, I think they thought we were, had been captured in Germany or something and they took us to this intelligence headquarters and mm -hmm. questioned us uh, and then after they realized what the story was they let us go and, mm -hmm. and uh, we got on an airplane and got flown back to 
London where and then somebody from our base came, flew down and picked us up and took us home. Mm -hmm. So that was number two. I can't remember what number three and four <laughs> and whatever. How many missions overall did you fly? 35. Wow. <laughs> And is there any other mission that you can recall? Uh, we, we were sent on one to a place called Politz, which is, mm -hmm. which is right up by Stettin, if you know where that is, but it's, a, it's on the Baltic, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's on the Baltic Sea there, Bay or whatever it's called. And um, we were at 28,000 feet it was a very, very clear day and somebody made the mistake because they thought we were too close to the group in front and did another total 360 degree circle which made those gunners down on the ground fix more accurately mm -hmm. and they were, they were shooting 88 millimeter shells up to 28,000 feet and picking off the lead airplane of each mm -hmm. squadron, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. So 44 planes were lost out of 144, but a lot of them did land in Sweden where, where they, were, they were flown back to the base within 24 hours. And mm -hmm. then of course they, they can't go and fight in the in the European theater anymore. They have to be sent back to the US of A. Mm -hmm. That's got something to do with the Geneva Convention. Mm -hmm. So you've, you flew 35 missions. Did you uh, become good friends with your crew? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And what do you remember, any uh, stories about the crew? Um, I really don't remember too too much. Uh, our, our tail gunner on that mission where we where we crashed, that was the end of his missions. He was mm -hmm. he was badly shook up and mentally disturbed or whatever, mm -hmm. but he never flew again. I can't remember who we had for a tail gunner after that. Mm -hmm. um, Any, anything else about the pilot? Um, Don Hadley, he, he was a very sort of a cocky somebody and very strong-willed and he was a very good pilot, but some things could, he, he was a blockhead, some things you just couldn't get through his head. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you one instance. We were back over for a big reunion we had in 1994. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I better call my daughter now uh, because uh, this is in England. I said, because it's, uh, it's earlier over there than here. Oh, no, he says, it's later. I, I, said, I said, no, Donald. I said, any time it's to the west, it's earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't argue with him, so. No, okay. Because he, he was an all right guy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, we, all of us knew he was a good pilot, so mm -hmm. if you so, want to be like that, fine. Okay. And when did you fly your 35th and final mission? Uh, I should be able to tell you to the exact date, but I would say it was probably the first week in February of 45. Okay. And it was actually over Berlin, Germany. which was, we didn't have any fighters, but the, the anti-aircraft over there was always bad. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I saw one morning, we were going to Berlin, the, the colonel announced we're going to Berlin, 17 people fainted. Wow. So what happened after your final mission? So then uh, I sort of on my own just took off for a couple of days and went somewhere. Mm -hmm. And while I was gone, they were looking for me to, to, 
I would have had a really great job, so, so mm -hmm. it was bad that I went. I, I was going to be able to be the navigator to fly important people like Churchill. Wow. And, and you missed that opportunity. And I missed that just because I took off. Mm -hmm. So then they send you to this, uh, I forget what they call them, some kind of a replacement depot. Mm -hmm. And there we knew from the rumors and whatever that you'd be there for 30 days. And uh, then we got on the uh, Queen Mary, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. to come home. And the Queen Mary uh, has emptied all of its big water tanks so they could put oil in them. Mm -hmm and they're burning fuel very, very fast. And the, the, the Queen Mary goes out into the ocean, has a air cover for about the first 100 miles or so. Mm -hmm. By then they're up to steam. They're, they're cruising at 36 knots, which is roughly 40 miles an hour. And they make the run across the ocean in four days plus, about four and a third days. That's fast. <laughs> so where, uh, where did you uh, disembark? Pier 92, New York City. And what rank were you when you uh, hit the shores again? I was the first lieutenant. Okay. And was that the end of your active service or were you still? Well, that, that was basically the, no, that was not the, into my active service. No, I was I was active until and the first thing they do when they send you home like that is mm -hmm. we went to Miami Beach for 30 days of whatever we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually ran into my brother who had been flying with the 15th Air Force over in Italy. And and what's your brother's name? My brother's name was Harry. Harry, okay. His, his formal name is Carter Harrison. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you ran into your brother. Right, and we were able to see each other a few times and mm -hmm. go to dinner or whatever. Okay, so, um, so we're now kind of in the spring of 45, around that time? That's right. While I, while I was there is when FDR died, so that puts it at the, April the 15th, roughly. Okay. And how did you find out about that? About what dying? Uh, about FDR dying. Gosh, I, I don't know if I read it in the newspaper or mm -hmm. heard it on the radio. It would be more likely I would see it in the news somewhere, but mm -hmm. I can't remember. Okay. So I what happened? Oh, okay, sorry. What happened after uh, 30 days in Miami Beach? So then I was transferred to uh, Ellington Field in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to remember what my duties were there. There was really not much duties. It was, they, they had thrown 10 or 15,000 officers into this place at one time. And uh, I ran into a couple of buddies of mine and there was no barracks on the base, so we mm -hmm. rented a house downtown. <coughs> mm -hmm. And we palled around together there for, for a while and uh, I then got transferred over to Hondo, Texas. Okay. What and, happened in Hondo? And, and, and Hondo is a school for basically a flight engineering school, but they, I, I'm trying to remember what it was called. But it's mm -hmm. all about conserving gas in an airplane, and especially a B-29, which is known for its, its it has certain idiosyncrasies. Mm -hmm. Taking off, it would overheat and burn a lot of gas, and uh, you couldn't keep 
putting the power to it to climb because it would overheat badly. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, Charles Lindbergh went, went out to the Pacific and taught, taught these people how to do this. Mm -hmm. It was all a matter of charts and measuring the loss of gas to see how much the plane now weighs. Mm -hmm. and, and so at any rate, I went through that school and then then I was, became a teacher of that. I'm trying to think of what it's called, but I, I can't mm -hmm. think of the word right now. At any time during this period, did you think you were going to be sent to the Pacific Theater now that the war in Europe was pretty much over? Yes. Okay. And uh, so, so while I'm in Hondo, Eventually, I, I was down there for probably four months, mm -hmm. and eventually um, VJ Day came. That was August something, August mm -hmm. 11th or 12th maybe. But I, I received a notice that, mm -hmm. that day or the day after that I should sign up for another two years or get out now. And so I said, well, I'll get out now because I wanted to go home or go somewhere and go to school. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So where was home for you after the war? Well, it was actually Asheville. Mm -hmm. um, and then, no, it wasn't really Asheville. It was actually Washington, D.C., because I went to Asheville for the first three or four months. Mm -hmm. And then I went up to Washington because I, went to, I wanted to go to George Washington University. Okay. And what were you doing at George Washington University? Well, I was studying. I was actually studying. I wanted to be in the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I graduated from school. I took the Foreign Service exam, and I made 78 on it. Just to give you an idea of how hard it is, two people in 1,000 pass it. That's a tough exam. It lasts five, no, it lasts six days. Mm -hmm. It lasts five and a half days, five, five mm -hmm. full days and a half a day Saturday. And you weren't one of the two who passed. I was I, I passed. I mean I, mm -hmm. I I mean I made a 78, which yeah. is not a great score or anything. But if two people out of a thousand pass, that's a pretty good score mm. because 70 is passing. Ah, okay. So tell me what happened then. So then I uh, I uh, decided I really didn't want to do that because I, I thought about all the. The, the jobs, the first 15 years in there are to hardship posts. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be over in Malaysia somewhere scrubbing my laundry on the rocks. <laughs> so what did so you do? So then what did I do? I, uh, I went to school. I continued going to school. Uh, that sounds funny. I, I, I was going to school and then I got a job over at the U.S. Senate working for uh, a North Carolina senator that I knew. Mm -hmm. And I was there for four years and I was not actually in his office, I worked in a document room. So I was there for four years. And uh, this is when I had my famous confrontation with one Joseph McCarthy. And uh, he was just labeling people as being communist when he did, probably didn't even know anything about them. He didn't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the one man, trying to, one man was Philip Jessup, I think his name was. He was. He was our roving ambassador to the UN. Joe McCarthy had picked him out as being a pink and everything. So he, I see him out in the hall and I knew him. And he said, he says, well, Zeb, what do you think of this? And I said, well, I said, let me see it. And 
I wrote it down. It says, well, Philip Jessup is this, Philip Jessup is that, signed by a subcommittee. I said, but you know, that's signed by you, so it, with no corroboration, it doesn't mean anything. And he jumped about a foot off the ground when I said that to him. So, at any rate, when the, when the Republicans took over, I was the very first person that was a Democrat that was fired from the job. <laughs> And what year was that, 1950? That was 52. 52, okay. What happened then? Oh, what did I do then? I, I went to the real estate business, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if I, I, I got married in 1947, I should mm -hmm. say that. Okay. And, um, we had two children. Mm -hmm. I, I, we, we were divorced in 1964. She comes up here occasionally to see her grandchildren and I see her. We're, we're still friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after the war, did you join any organization such as the American Legion? No, no I was never a professional soldier, okay. so to speak. Did you at least go to college on the GI Bill? Yes. Okay. And have you received any veterans benefits aside from the GI Bill? Well, I, I, yes. I, I, I have privileges at the hospital and I get my medications from them. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, yes. Okay. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, it, it was actually very important because uh, that that was a that was I believe the last war that had any uh, oh, I have a hard time of thinking of words sometimes mm -hmm. that had any real purpose. I mean, it was it was not not so much a political war. It had it had a purpose to keep. Mm -hmm keep the world from being overrun by a madman, to be put it very bluntly. Mm -hmm. And it seems like all the world wars since then, including the Korean and the Vietnamese and whatever else, the, the Vietnamese war was very political. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so, so yes, I, I, feel I, I feel I served an important, an important duty uh, doing that at that time, yes. Okay. Did your children or your grandchildren um, enter the military? Uh, my, my, no. no. My, my son never, my son never went. He was, he was the right age to be a Vietnam veteran, but he never was in it. Okay. So, Mr. Heights, what are you doing these days? What am I doing these days? Well, at 88 years old, I'm actually working in a photo lab up at Walmart. In what town? Framingham. Okay. And I understand you're also a photographer and an artist. Right. Let's just show good folks out there what you do. And tell us, uh, I think that's oh, the we Lighthouse Americans. We didn't do this, did we? Mm -hmm. I was thinking that was the one with the monument. Uh -huh. Okay, and that is, uh, that's a lighthouse in Narragansett, right? That's a lighthouse in Narragansett Bay, yes. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been a photographer? Probably 50 years. Uh-huh. And I I, I've been a serious photographer since, uh, let's say, 1965. Uh-huh. And is that a hobby, profession? It's a, it's a hobby. Okay. And uh, you said you were an artist as well. Yes. And what kind of medium do you use? I, I'm an oil painter. Mm -hmm. uh, wait, just. And any paint. specialty? There's an old church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's very nice. And you are also a writer, according to your uh, postcard. Uh, what well, I, I don't. I don't have any real formal. <laughs> <laughs> I write occasionally, but I don't, I've never published anything. Okay. Well, Zebulon, is there anything else you'd like to uh, say be, uh, for those who are going to be watching this in the future? I, I want to show, I want to show a 
couple more of these oh, pictures okay, sure. of my art. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a barn down in Western North Carolina. Uh huh. And uh, let's see. This is kind of interesting. This is a picture of John Lennon and Yoko Ono, which I didn't take, but my son took at a at a sort of a happenstance situation down uh -huh. in New York City. This this picture was taken directly across the street from the from the uh, Dakota where mm -hmm. they lived. Mm -hmm. Very nice. This is a church in Spain by the side of the road mm -hmm. near Segovia. Mm -hmm. We'll get that in a minute. And we'll do one more. Uh, yeah, yeah, here's one more. This is uh, the town hall in Innsbruck, Austria. Wow. So you've done a bit of traveling too. Yep. Uh, yeah, I've been around a little bit. Mm -hmm. So let's be close to wrapping this up. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, the, the only thing I can say, this has been a very pleasant interview. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And I have a few other things which might be quite pertinent, which I will bring at a later time that you could use. I have some pictures of myself uh -huh. when I was 21 mm -hmm. and actively in the service. And uh, I, I have a, it's actually almost a whole book, but it's got a lot of stuff in it. It's, it's all about, um, it's all about mostly the crash in Belgium and it's, mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of it was written by our co-pilot, Town O'Mackey, who, mm -hmm. who just died in, in the 1st of December. And uh, Donald Hadley, our pilot, <coughs> who, who, was, who died about a year ago last August. Mm -hmm. So there are now two members of the original crew, and that would be myself, and the other person would be Milton Griffin, who presently resides in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And he was our waste gunner. Mm -hmm. Well, Zebulon Heights, uh, this has been indeed a very pleasant interview, very informative, and we want to thank you for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you, thank you very you, much. Thank you.